Good afternoon. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Health, Environment, and Community Engagement Committee. My name is Cam Gordon. I'm chair of the committee, and today I'm joined by Council Members Kano, Andrew Johnson, uh, Lisa Bender, and Jacob Fry. We are a quorum of the committee, so we can conduct our business. There's four items on the agenda today. Um, one is a public hearing, uh, two are on the consent agenda, and one is a discussion item. I think what I'm going to do is take the consent items first, just because if a lot of people came for that, then we can do our public hearing afterwards, although I'm not anticipating that the public hearing will be very lengthy, but we'll have a small staff report. So uh, the con consent items, there's two of them. Number two on the written agenda is uh, authorizing a contract with the Minnesota Department of Health to accept $20,000 for lead and healthy home services that include in-home education events and a lead paint awareness campaign. And item number three is a resolution declaring Minneapolis a pollinator-friendly community uh, and encouraging residents and businesses to adopt pollinator-friendly practices. We'll also be um, making sure that the city-owned property um, is pollinator-friendly and we um, limit and eventually eliminate the use of pesticides and plant um, pollinator-friendly um, forage. Uh, any discussion or anybody want to pull either of those consent items? Seeing none, then I will move both of those items forward. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Those two um, items then pass the committee unanimously. And then we're gonna go back to our public hearing and we're gonna start that with a, uh, a staff report. And I think that uh, Mr. Doton is gonna uh, give us our, our uh, uh, no, he's not here. There he is, okay, sorry about that. Um, a, re uh, a report first to kind of uh, start this out. This is a, a ordinance amendment uh, having to do with our abrasive blasting permits. Um, and that's an interesting, uh, interesting name Chair, for council it. members, Thank appreciate the time. And uh, my name is Jim Doton. I'm the environmental services manager for the uh, health department. And I'm here before you to talk about some changes we propose in the abrasive blasting ordinance. And just to give a background, uh, we, we've had a history of uh, enforcement issues with the abrasive blasting ordinance. And one of the problems we have is the ambiguity in the current language, which states that uh, with the, the sand or the abrasive material will be contained on site. What we've done is gone and did research across the country and uh, looking at different ordinances and see how they've worked. With the language that we've selected, it comes from Boston. It was approved in the mid-1980s and has been executed very successfully out there and since, since has been adopted countrywide by many other municipalities, cities, and, and towns. Uh, what it basically states is that uh, a violation will constitute uh, visible emissions beyond the vertically extended lines of the property, deposition of visible amounts of particulate matter on public or private property adjacent, or failure to engage, get a permit prior to getting the permit. The uh, second part is uh, deals with the lead portion of it. And what we've done in the past is that we required lead testing of the property. If the person did not complete the lead, that portion of it, what the city did then is go on out and test the surfaces ourselves to verify that it's lead free or confirm the presence of lead. Uh, what we are proposing to do is put that onto the contractor as part of the permit to obtain lead testing prior by a certified lead assessor, and the permit will not be complete without that part of the application. And basically get us out of the lead testing business. We are, we are fairly short staffed, and it's a strain on city resources. Uh, I'd like to thank Michelle Anderson over here for her work on this ordinance as well and uh, putting the putting this together. Led, uh, Michelle works for the lead unit. Do you have any questions of us or the proposed changes? I don't see any questions. Thank you very much for the report. It's pretty straightforward. Um, with that, then I'm going to open the public hearing. We have a public hearing whenever there is an ordinance being amended. Um, uh, is anyone signed up, Madam Clerk? Seeing none, then looks like nobody's here to speak on this issue. Anybody? This will be your last chance then to raise any concerns or give us any insights. Seeing none, then I'll close the public hearing. Any comments or discussion um, from council members? I 
I will move approval of this then. Seeing no discussion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That um, carries then. And that will go forward for final approval to the city council with the other items we've approved. And now we have a discussion item, our last item, and this is uh, having to do with asthma and air quality. And Mr. Huff, I believe, is going to start out this presentation. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, council members. My name is Dan Huff. I'm the Director of Environmental Health within the Minneapolis Health Department. Um, there has been uh, uh, and continues to be a lot of concern around asthma in our community. And so we wanted to take the opportunity today to share some of our expertise from the Health Department on the multiple causes of asthma and what are some of the things we're doing um, to address this. I am joined today in addition to the, uh, my co-presenters, Lisa Smestad and Patrick Hanlon by McGean Keynes. Uh, McGean is an epidemiologist in the health department and um, was the author of the um, um, briefing paper that is part of the uh, RCA today. Uh, and then I'm also joined by Eliza Schell, who has uh, uh, been one of our project uh, managers in our Healthy Homes grant and also worked on one of the asthma grants that Lisa will be talking about some pretty astounding results that we received through that. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, go over what asthma is. Uh, asthma is an inflammatory response in the lungs, uh, and it causes uh, uh, breathing to be quite difficult for those of us who have either suffered from asthma or have loved ones that have. Um, we know how difficult that is for someone who's suffering from an asthma attack. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about today is uh, what's considered or called the barrel theory of asthma. Um, asthma is complex. It's a complex inflammatory response. And it's not exactly clear what causes asthma, but we know there are a lot of asthma triggers. And the barrel theory says that once someone's barrel is full, then that triggers an asthmatic attack. Now, everyone has a different size barrel. Some people are incredibly resilient, and you know it may be a, a huge water tank full before they overflow, while some people may have a barrel the size of a thimble. Uh, to kind of give you an example of this, let's say um, uh, if, if it was a dog, you'd own the dog, but we know that we don't own cats. So let's say you're owned by a cat. Um, that already provides some allergens. So your bear already has some kind of stuff in it. Um, let's say you're allergic to eggs and you eat eggs, then it goes up even higher. And then it's ragweed season and that, you know, you're allergic to ragweed, you're full any slight thing would then push it over into that inflammatory cascade. Once that cascade starts, it often has a synergistic effect with itself and causes that severe asthmatic attack. Um, so that's uh, one of the things we talk about with the, the barrel theory. Different people respond different ways to different triggers. And there is somehow a summative effect but also there is some type of logarithmic effect at times as these interact with each other. So asthma triggers, um, we have uh, things that we call an inflammatory trigger and we have things that we call an irritant trigger. Inflammatory means that it elicits an immune response. So it's your body thinking that it's something it needs to fight off. These are allergies often referred to. Cockroaches, uh, dust, um, cats or animals, dogs, uh, pollen, food allergies, mold. These are things that if you are sensitive to this, then it could trigger an inflammatory response in your body. Some people can tolerate mold. Some people can't. Same thing with dogs or cats. It really depends on the own individual's allergic sensitivity. Now, irritant triggers are a little different. An irritant trigger can irritate anyone's lungs. Ozone pollution is a good one, since we talked about ozone at our last or a, a month ago. Um, ozone is a, it's a highly reactive, unstable chemical, and therefore it robs tissue of, or it robs other molecules of uh, atoms, and therefore destabilizes those. In a sense, it destroys your tissues because it's robbing molecules away from it. So that is an irritant. It actually will destroy living tissue. Um, so air pollution is a common one we talk about irritants. Um, you know, if you run in the cold, you're going to get irritated and your lungs are going to respond to that. 
Um, so asthma is a complex interplay between inflammatory and irritant triggers. Now, if we look at asthma hospitalizations, now this is an important thing to talk about. We're not talking about people who have asthma. We're talking about people whose asthma, for whatever reason, has become so bad that they actually were admitted to a hospital. And if we look, we see not all the state is equal in hospitalizations for asthma. And if we go deeper down to Hennepin County, we see that even though Hennepin County here, that darker blob or the darker green means higher incidence of hospitalization, that statewide dark blob is actually because of very much in the core city in Ramsey and Minneapolis, we have a disproportionate number of people that are being hospitalized for asthma. Going a little deeper still, we see in Minneapolis, it's not just that all of Minneapolis has a higher incidence of asthma, but it is really located within a couple of areas within the city. So one of the things we should talk about is what's driving this inequity. There's something different between someone who lives in Phillips neighborhood and someone that lives in Dakota County. There's a difference between someone who lives in Phillips neighborhood and Minnetrista, and there's something between Phillips and Bancroft neighborhoods. What's going on here? Um, one of the things, and we're not going to talk about in this conversation today, but it is a driver of the inequity, and that is health care policy. If someone has a good health care home and they seek that health care home and good affordable health care, and they're able to have a good relationship with their provider they manage or more likely to manage that asthma and not end up in the hospital with uncontrolled asthma. That's one thing that will drive this inequity. We're going to talk about other triggers and how inequities may be inherent here. But I do want to just, just call that one out. So we're going to talk about asthma as a health justice issue. It is. And we need, as a city need to wrestle with that. Uh, Lisa and Patrick are going to talk to you about different ways that the barrel gets filled so that we can talk about how can we lower that barrel. And then we're also, Lisa and Patrick will talk about what are the things that the city is doing now to help to address those things that fill up our barrel. Right. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Lisa. Patrick. Chair Gordon, council members, yeah. my name is Patrick Hanlon. I'm the environmental initiatives manager for the city of Minneapolis. I'm going to <clears throat> talk about air pollution and its relation to asthma, but first I just want to start out by talking a little bit about the balance of talking about air pollution. Uh, we live in a city that's relatively clean in terms of air quality and relatively low in the amount of pollution in Minneapolis. Um, we face a lot of issues concerning air pollution that are outside of our control. A few weeks ago we had, uh, or maybe a month ago, we had uh, some of the forest fires in uh, Canada were affecting our air quality here in Minneapolis. So there's some of those issues that are at play. We have uh, coal mines in, uh, or coal factories in, in China that affect our air quality here. So there's aspects that are outside of our control. Could you, could you just, With, go ahead. So you said relatively clean, and then I was immediately curious relative to what? D to other, Duluth or Los Angeles? Yeah, maybe not Duluth, but to other major cities, to Los Angeles, to New York, some uh, some of the larger cities across the country. So okay. relatively so, but, speaking. To the rest of the state, are we relatively To the rest clean? of the state, no, we would be relatively uh, more polluted. Poor air quality. Correct, and I'll go through some of those okay. a little bit. Thanks. Yep. Just so we understand. Yep, and so there's still areas of concern. Um, looking at particulate matter, that's one of the issues. Um, within Minneapolis, and I'll show you some slides here, that there is concerns with particulate matter that has uh, great impacts on, on health, not only with asthma, but other conditions. Uh, ground level ozone, you had a presentation before council about a month ago talking about the federal air quality standards, and then there's also a number of days that are over health risk values, I'll go over that. There are environmental justice issues, uh, and I'll go, as we go through these slides, keep those in mind as you look at the areas that are affected by um, air pollution. And like I said, the issues go beyond asthma. We'll be talking about asthma today, but these things affect respiratory um, respiratory areas and then also um, uh, cancer uh, with, with some of the air pollution issues that we have, cancer rates. Um, 
in Minneapolis, uh, according to the MPCA and MDH report that was put out a, a couple weeks ago, a, a joint report that was put out, there are about 600 emergency room visits uh, due to asthma, uh, due to air pollution for asthma. And um, in that report, the commissioner had stated how uh, sensitive populations are more directly impacted by poor air pollution. So looking at uh, the elderly and then looking at children, and especially children that have uncontrolled asthma, and so there's also aspects of access to affordable health care. I know my sister had asthma growing up in those cases where we had a, a asthma inhaler was not present. Those were very scary times. And so I can imagine how uh, people without access to those medications can have a much higher uh, concern with concerning uh, asthma and getting access to health care. Um, the report I'm going to go over, I'm going to use this report, the major findings from this report. It was a 10 year uh, study that was done co-sponsored by the EPA and the South Coast Air Quality Management District, looking at air pollution and its relationship to asthma. And so I'm gonna use the major findings of that study and then talk about those in terms of air quality here in Minneapolis. Uh, asthma and major air pollutants have, uh, can cause significant lung deficiencies and those deficiencies can be uh, permanent into adulthood. And so looking at the major air pollutants, nitrogen dioxide, atmospheric acidity, uh, NOx, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide have associations with that atmospheric acidity. PM 2.5 and PM 10, those are the fine particulates, um, cause that decreased lung function. And this map right here is of nitrogen dioxide. You may have seen this in the news last year. It was a University of Minnesota study, the Marshall Group looking at uh, national amounts of, nationally looking at nitrogen dioxide levels. In Minneapolis, you see a clear disparity uh, within the Minneapolis center compared to the uh, suburban outer rings. Uh, I asked our friends over at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency uh, to send us this data. This is uh, PM 2.5, so this is fine particulates. Looking at Minneapolis, again, you see the disparity between uh, suburban areas and the amount of fine particulates um, in the urban center and even uh, places within the urban center. And so these, this PM 2.5 can be, like Dan said, as a trigger for causing asthma. And so you see the discrepancy between outer suburban areas and Minneapolis. Uh, again, asthma and major air pollutants, this graph off to the left shows uh, distance from roadways. It's in meters. So it shows, I put a line there at 800 meters. Uh, where you see those particulate, those fine particulate levels start to drop off from major roadways. And then I showed on the right-hand side, um, heading out from Hiawatha and showing what that looks like in our city and how far from that roadway those fine particulates spread out from those roadways. And it heads out to Bloomington Avenue South, which in itself is in the small roadway. And so you can see how some of the, the pollution that comes from uh, transportation can be a major issue in a city where you have uh, major roadways that are running together on top of certain industrial areas that can be that can uh, contribute to those fine particulate issues. Asthma and ozone. Uh, children, uh, uh, a finding from the study that children living in high ozone communities are up to three times like more likely to develop asthma. You had the presentation a month ago uh, talking about ground level ozone in Minneapolis, and these are the days that are. This graph is days that are over that. Uh, the amount that was recommended by the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee to the EPA, and those are the number of days uh, over that standard that we've had here in Minneapolis. Um, and so that's a concern here in Minneapolis is how many of those days we end up getting over uh, our ground level ozone standards. Uh, local exposures, bald organic compounds, those can also be, they can be uh, an uh, inflammatory and uh, irritant trigger. And so uh, there's a, this is a study by the uh, British Medical Association that children exposed to some bald organic compounds can be four times as likely to develop uh, asthma than those who are not. And so, um, and then uh, there's another quote there from uh, inhaling paint fumes and those can be some of the, those household things that uh, Lisa might get into um, where children exposed to those, you can develop uh, asthma from that as well, or they can be asthma triggers. So uh, the Minneapolis air quality study that we're doing right now is looking at those specific volatile organic compounds around the city and uh, where we might have exposure, people might have exposures within our city to those volatile organic compounds. And this map is showing where we found hits uh, around Minneapolis and doing our sampling that are over health risk values for volatile organic compounds. And we'll be having a report on that study 
we just did our the last round of that study last week, pulled all the sampling in, and so we'll be looking at the data from that. And we have data that's available that I can send out to you that's up through uh, February of this past year. So the good news, this is a lot of looking at this, it, it sounds like a lot of bad news. Um, the good news is that when the research has shown that when children who move to cleaner environments, uh, when they move to those areas, they show improvements in lung function. And so um, the lesson from that is not that we want people to move, but that if we improve the air quality here in Minneapolis, we can see improvements in uh, uh, children and their lung function with uh, how it relates to asthma. So what are we doing in Minneapolis to address air quality? Um, the things that we're doing to uh, increase bikeways and be uh, one of the best uh, bikeable cities in the United States. Uh, the efforts that we're doing in mass transit to get people off the roads, those are the transportation is a major pollutant. Uh, we have one of the greenest fleets in the United States for a major city. Uh, looking at improved traffic flow studies to reduce idling times. So getting, uh, looking at times that we can stop people from idling at, at stoplights and getting people th moving through the city. Um, some of the green business match uh, work that we're doing uh, with the city or, or with the state in uh, reducing pollution. We're, we're looking at 25,000 pounds of emission reduction through the green business matching grant program. Looking at some of our energy use reduction through the clean, uh, clean energy partnership and then some of the benchmarking work that we're doing in reducing uh, emissions that are coming from our energy use. Tree plantings around the city, uh, tree plantings, trees uh, improve air quality both in fine particulates and then also reducing urban heat island effect. And then taking part in new research with when the University of Minnesota uh, comes out with new research and examining how we can use that information uh, to address air quality in Minneapolis, looking at how we can use some of our air quality data that we're doing here and then both with the state and how we can uh, address air quality in Minneapolis. And then regulations. Jim just came up here and talked about one that can be uh, with abrasive blasting and passing that is, is having standards for abrasive blasting. And then another example of that would be our idling ordinance and getting people to stop idling, especially in areas that uh, where a lot of people con congregate uh, around schools and uh, facilities where, where buses are idling. So our air quality is good. Um, it's not great. And the efforts that we're doing here in Minneapolis will continue to make that better. Council, uh, Council Chair Gordon, Council Members, I'm Lisa Smested. I'm, I'm the manager of the Lead Healthy Homes Unit for the City of Minneapolis. Like many other health determinants, lead and asthma prevalence seems to be linked to poverty as seen on this map. The three highest zip codes for asthma are in North and Northeast Minneapolis. Outdoor air quality alone does not account for the disparity we see in these maps. It could be affected by the lack of adequate health care or the conditions in the home and the indoor air allergen exposure. Back in the early uh, 2000s, during inspections, the lead unit kept seeing families with nebulizers and asthma. So when HUD started offering healthy home grants that could address housing-based allergen sources, we jumped at the chance to apply. We were awarded two competitive uh, HUD grants for healthy homes um, that ranged from 2003 to 2009, and asthma was a big focus of these two grants. But by 2012, HUD was not receiving enough funding to offer separate healthy homes grants and has switched to including healthy homes initiative money and lead hazard control grants. But it could only be spent on properties enrolled in the grant. I hesitate to say it's a problem, but not all children with asthma have lead poisoning, nor are they under six. And those two items are required for as mandatory qualifications to receive services under this grant funding. We have a small UCARE grant that was granted uh, this year that we are working on, but that's only going to serve maybe 20 children. Through all of these grants, we are working with community nurses, American Lung, Ramsey County Health Department, and the Minnesota Department of Health. Why is there such a change in asthma rates? Some of it has to do with the building materials. Sheetrock is a plaster between paper. 
Wet paper and particle board act as pre-chewed baby food for mold. Mac Pierce, who is a national expert on mold, likes to say even the three little pigs weren't dumb enough to build houses out of paper. Uh, we've tightened our building so much for to conserve energy or for soundproofing. I was in a building uh, that was soundproof for Mac, and the family was so concerned about energy and tightening up their house that they had closed off all the attic vents, and it was literally raining inside the attic because the moisture from cooking, showering, and exhaling had nowhere to go. Mold in your home has been recognized as a health hazard for a few thousand years, as seen by this quote from the Bible. Renters are particularly vulnerable to mold exposure because they don't control the building. Maintenance staff may respond to complaints, but they do not think about what happens to the other side of the wall. In this, in this photo, the renter upstairs had a bathtub overflow and the renter below did not notice there was a problem until there was this horrific odor coming from their closet and a lot of their possessions had been ruined. The move towards more water absorbing materials makes like particle board cabinets in bathroom cabinets and kitchen results in occupants having more mold exposure. A fact of plumbing I've noticed is that sooner or later it leaks. This was caused by a, this mold infestation you see here was caused by a slow drip leak under the sink. The landlord was labeling the tenant as a crazy old lady because the cabinet was dry to touch but it was warped and when we cut it open we found an excellent breeding ground for mold. The building code requires ventilation in a bathroom, but that can mean a window that opens. In a Minnesota winter, you don't open the windows when taking a shower. Warm, wet air meets cold air and it, a cold surface, and it results in condensation. The picture on the right is where a metal frame of the window causes a cold spot on the sheetrock next to the windows. Again, we've changed how we're doing our buildings. Current research is starting to link mold exposure for young children to causing asthma instead of just being a trigger for established asthma. Most people don't know why they're sick in their houses. What is causing the asthma? This family didn't know until a trained inspector pulled the bed away from an exterior wall. Furniture pushed up against walls can trap moist air, creating a microclimate where mold can grow. When there are economic downturns, relatives crowd into housing meant for fewer people, and high rents make it hard for larger families to find affordable places to live. Another housing-based asthma trigger we see a lot of are cockroaches. This picture shows the cockroach, cockroach poop, which is visible at this property and is a well-known asthma trigger. Some of these asthma allergens we bring into our own homes. A cat can keep mice out, but dry cat saliva is an allergen. Many people respond to a mold odor by trying to cover it up with deodorizers, which really just add to problems by adding additional volatile organic particles to the air. Personal products like cologne or hairspray can cause problems, and even burning candles, which, candles, which adds very small particles to indoor air. One of the projects we were lucky to land with the, a grant from the state health department was to educate immigrants on the difference between the difference uh, hazards in housing as a result of how our housing is built for our weather versus the climate where they may have come from. This education was given in Spanish as a pilot project to point out seven principles of a healthy home, which overlapped really well with asthma triggers. And this education was provided to about 50 individuals. And we received additional funding in the um, consent item that was on the agenda earlier today to continue that work. So what did we, did we do with all this money we got from the HUD grants? Well, we did inspections, we issued corrective orders in rental properties, and some properties we fixed up things like doing integrated pest management services, but mostly we provided these three products that we have here before you today. So let me tell you about some of our, one of our clients. Most referrals came from nurses with pediatric asthma patients. Uh, one child was referred by a school nurse because of too many missed days of school related to asthma. This child had nosebleeds almost every morning. We gave them a HEPA air cleaner for the child's bedroom and the asthma, or and the nosebleeds stopped. In addition, conditions allowing mold to grow were identified and corrected. 
we did integrated pest management in response to a mice infestation, and we provided allergen pillow covers and mattress covers. We provided, also provided an allergen rated vacuum. No medic, the family also was not, didn't have medications in the house appropriate to the child. Um, appointments were not being made with the primary care physician, and they didn't have an asthma action plan. To resolve the insurance issues, they preferred to state public programs. The nurse that came in with us under this program completed an asthma action plan for the child. And beyond asthma, the home was referred to our lead hazard control program, so they got new windows, and the lead hazards were reduced in the house. Uh, they didn't have a lot of furniture. They were referred into house calls and provided with furniture. And then they had ongoing asthma care um, because they now had insurance and it was provided by the nurses to provide proper inhaler technique and they were referred to a specialist care by their primary care physician and they kept up on their medical visits. Multiple research projects in the state and across the nation have similar results to what we did with our HUD project. They're showing that a home visit by a nurse and a housing inspector provides a big return on investment it is cheaper to provide these services than to provide hospitalizations. The health department has been working on the coalition around House File 1479 to allow Medicaid reimbursement for similar services as the grants provided. This is one way to get funding to pay for the practical solution of how to reduce asthma, and many states are in the process of getting similar legislation passed to have Medicaid pay for inspections, and some of these products. All of the previous research done in Minneapolis in the metro area and outstate Minnesota is lining up with the national demonstration projects. I'm going to end with this slide on the impact on school attendance. Asthma care is an equity issue for health care and housing that impacts school attendance. Our research showed that a child would be in school after they went through our program a child would be in school for 22 more days in that school year than they would have been because of missing because of asthma. All studies following these models are showing fewer hospitalizations, fewer emergency department visits, more days in school, and more days where a child and their family's activities were not being defined by their asthma. The return on investment was not just in dollars, but in the changes in how families were living. Asthma is a complex issue, but there are things that we can do as a city that address asthma and especially address the inequities associated with asthma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, all the work. I think this, uh, this investment in healthy homes and uh, missing days of school is really striking. Uh, it pays off. I don't know if committee members have any questions. Um, you know, there's a lot of information here. Uh, the thing that I have a little uh, harder time getting uh, around is the air pollution problem. Seems like it comes from many sources. We're talking about cars, uh, particulates. Um, I noticed you didn't necessarily mention um, uh, burning wood in the city or the garbage burner, um, and you don't necessarily have to. I'm not sure if we've looked at that, but it just tells me that all the little sources can add to this particular matter. I know we get the biggest maybe uh, bang for our efforts with the volatile compounds and when we can really address some of those um, industry and some of that business. But um, I don't know if there's any other questions because our action is just to receive and file this report um, and hopefully keep it handy as we move forward and make other decisions about where we're going to make our investments. Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say this is, I think, a really important issue. I appreciate all the time um, staff has put into this. I, you know, it's a complicated issue and I think. Um, these bigger policy questions about our transportation system and the way that our buildings are contributing to this, you know, that's what we need to be doing over the long term to make sure we're addressing this. Um, but I also appreciate that we are doing the immediate steps that are needed to address this home by home in the city and getting into the places where kids are being hospitalized and impacted today. Uh, so I think that's a good balance. And I, um, I think both are really important, you know, as we're making these longer term changes, we still have these immediate needs. And I'm really supportive of putting the investments that we need into making sure that we have the resources so that we can um, continue to fill these gaps as it takes time to make those longer term policy changes. 
Thank you much. I'll also note that we uh, asthma is one of the new community indicators that we're discussing, and I think it, it'll be a. Great to look at some of these maps where we've drilled down by neighborhood and where we can see some of those colors changing and some of the levels changing and it would be certainly um, good to move it faster rather than um, slower. So I appreciate that. So I'll move to receive and file this item then. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries. And then uh, there's no further business before us. So we are adjourned, but maybe the uh, uh, Paul and folks can just stay for a minute and we can, we can talk.